Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to uh, this seminar series uh, jointly organized by uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies and Southeast Asian Art Academic Program here at SOAS. Uh, my name is Panga Ardiansa, uh, doctoral student at the Department of History of Art and Archaeology, and I will be uh, chairing the sessions. And uh, before we start this talk today, I want to have a shout out actually to my colleague, uh, Pipat Krajian, that are designing all the posters that we are currently sharing at the uh, at the Facebook and all the social media here. And uh, to us to share about the news about this uh, webinar. So uh, it is my privilege today uh, to welcome uh, the speakers for uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, Michael Falser from uh, Heidelberg University. Uh, Michael has academic uh, background in architecture and art history. And uh, between 2009 and uh, 2017, he works in the cluster of excellence, uh, Asia and Europe in a global context, the dynamics of transculturality at the Heidelberg University in Germany. Uh, he researches about anchor words for his uh, professorial requirements, and he is also active as a preservation architect and also World Heritage Consultant for UNESCO and Ecomos International. Um, his current research uh, and teaching focus on the combined field of global architectural history and cultural heritage studies. Uh, and then after visiting professorship across Europe and Asia, he is now teaching as associate professor at the Institute of Art History at Heidelberg University. And he's been keeping busy because he already starts a new research project at the Institute of Architectural History at the Technical University of Munich, uh, investigating uh, the uh, global uh, German colonial project as a global building project around 1900 and as a transcultural heritage today. So uh, Michael, thank you for uh, sharing your research with us today in the seminar. Uh, next, uh, also here with us today is uh, Joanna Wolfarts, uh, will be the discussion for the today's seminars. Uh, Joanna is a visiting lecturer in the Southeast Asian art at SOAS. Uh, she specializes in Southeast Asian cultural history uh, with a specific focus on Cambodia. Uh, her recent research explored the interaction between pre-moderns and contemporary visual cultures. Uh, via questions of archives, citation, materiality, and power. Uh, this includes writing on contemporary photographic practices and the reuse and digital manipulations of archival images in creating national and individual narratives in Cambodia. So, uh, Joanna, good morning. I'm really glad that you can join us today. Uh, so uh, for today's talks uh, is titled Angkor Wat Cambodia, a transcultural history of heritage. And it will systematically map out the 12th century temple of Angkor Wat uh, that unfolded within the, sorry. Uh, it will systematically map out uh, the 12th century temple of Angkor Wat as a global heritage icon. Uh, Michael will present a, concept, a conceptual uh, connected history of Angkor Wat that unfolded within the transcultural interstices of European and Asian projects uh, spanning the colonial, post-colonial, nationalist, and global era. Taken from his recently published uh, monograph, a two volume called uh, Angkor Wat, a transcultural history of heritage. Uh, the book traces uh, the uh, multiple life of Angkor Wat uh, over the 150 years long uh, period from 800, sorry, 860s to the 2010s and presented for the first time a kind of uh, visual anthology of the temple with more than 1400 historic photographs, uh, architectural plans and also samples of public media. Uh, after the presentations uh, from Michael, uh, Joanna will give a response uh, on the topics raised by Michael on the talks. Uh, okay, so I don't want to drag this any longer. Uh, so I guess, Michael, the screen is yours. 
Thank you very much for, for your very kind introduction. And thank you, Joanna, also for joining and commenting critically on, on my presentation. It's a great pleasure and honor to um, present um, results of my research today. I actually, before uh, by preparing this talk today, I had the choice of you know going into one specific detail and discussing uh, uh, an element within my larger research, or uh, going through the whole narrative of my book um, um, on these two volumes that uh, that it has, and giving you an idea of the overall storyline, including the overall kind of rich um, the rich sources of my visual material that I found. And uh, so, please uh, don't be. Um, uh, you know, uh, shocked by the amount of slides that I will show you. It's more, you will see at the end that they will all fit together in a sense to create a visual ontology of, uh, of a 12th century temple in its history of representation, media representation and from the 19th to 21st centuries. So this is my, my overall idea. And um, now I th should actually uh, share my screen and I hope it will work. Um, Please tell me if you if you can hear me and see the slides properly. Yes, the slide is good. Is this okay? Very good. Okay, um, going into into the into the the presentation, I want to show you one illustration that's uh, particularly interesting for me, uh, and and my my approach. What you will see in a guardian figures holding their umbrellas, and the whole scene. The whole scene is uh, framed in the background <clears throat> by a temple scenario that you would, of course, right away identify as a 12th century architecture from Cambodia, from Angkor. And um, so you would assume that it's one of these uh, moments when official representatives, uh, political representatives from another country come for state visit to Cambodia and are shown uh, uh, the temples uh, in order to give grandeur to the visit. Um, the whole problem is that the Cambodian is missing in the picture in terms of the host is not a Cambodian and I will show you uh, what it is. To um, kind of give you a solution to this illustration, um, you will see now that um, this photograph has been taken not in Cambodia, but has been taken during the International Colonial Exhibition in 1931 in Paris, um, where the whole central part of a 12th century temple called Angkor Wat, which you can see as the so-called original in the same moment in time, had been reconstituted in full scale, which is maybe the, the largest ever made full scale replica of an Asian site, of an Asian temple ever produced on the European continent. So what you would see here is that you have on 1931, two Angkor Wat's innocence standing on uh, uh, different continents 10,000 kilometers apart from each other. So how do we work with this as an, as an entry to, to the presentation today? Um, I will just give you one or two slides of a, a theoretical background to, to, to the whole storyline. Um, as the topic is um, related to a transcultural a mode of what cultural heritage could be, um, we have to kind of overcome the old standing classical attributes uh, that we um, um, attribute to cultural heritage. For example, place. Normally you would say a cultural heritage element like Angkor Wat is precisely embedded in one territorial spot on the planet. But on this case, if you go back to the slides of uh, 1931, it's a multi-sided configuration. Um, for example, on the lower, on the right side on this uh, chart, you see identity. So to whom it belonged at this temple site in 1931 in these two elements. And you would certainly see that the audience of 1931 in Paris would not be the same as, let's say, a Buddhist uh, monk um, in 1931 walking through his monastery temple site in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Uh, for example, one spot here is time. They normally, would, uh, we would assume that a uh, uh, cultural heritage element um, uh, or a property is one of long, of a permanence, of, of long uh, permanent uh, stability. But in this case, the temple site reconstituted in Paris was just on the spot for six months and then disappeared forever um, because it was dismantled. And um, uh, for example, um, the status, um, normally you would assume that a cultural heritage um, um, property 
is a one that has a homogeneous situation in terms of fabric form, style, um, um, and, and, and construction. But in this case, you will see that, of course, the building in Cambodia is a different stone monolithic element, not a monolithic, but solid element in relation to um, a, 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 an element that is um, um, on permanent display in a totally different materiality than it has been uh, so in Paris and as, as, as its counterpart in Cambodia. So you will have kind of um, destabilize as a starting point your, your um, thinking of what cultural heritage, the physical built heritage should be. So in my book, I'm going at, at doing a dual approach. One is, of course, talking about the material-based research of the artifacts, so about architecture, about the building itself, but then also question its positioning and in the intellectual history of a concept that is called cultural heritage. I mean, as we all know, Angkor, Angkor Wat built in the 12th century was not meant to be cultural heritage from the start. It was a, and it still is an active Buddhist, originally Hinduist and then um, Buddhist site until today. And, and the cultural heritage regime, as we understand it from the European sense, um, it has been appropriated, has been uh, put on the temple in later stages. So we would kind of see this uh, configuration in a global connectivity uh, that also relates to uh, the originally European disciplines called art and architectural history, archaeology, ethnography, etc., and to reflect on how this original, uh, originally European discipline made their career non-Europe in Cambodia during different um, periods and time, and how these disciplines, there might be others, of course. Um, framed the, the element into what it should be cultural heritage. So in, in the long path, we should identify the different operational terms and applied taxonomies that are applied to this uh, as culture, art, heritage, as terms like original, what is the center, what is the periphery, where the object came from, where did it migrate, and came back maybe, and all these elements that you would apply as, as taxonomies to you, the disciplines you're working on. And they involve political and institutional regimes and their actors, so giving them a name. You will see uh, different um, actors within my storyline, and you can trace them down in history and say what were their intentions back then. You can also go and uh, analyze and identify the applied techniques that are relevant for the for the storyline. For example, um, the physical replication strategies in the 19th and 20th century, translocation, restitution, simulation, representation, all these elements that are uh, relevant. And you can then um, see how the conceptual framings on Angkor Wat had been changing through time. They are still dynamic and still developing until today and in the future. But that's the only um, 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 slide that I show you with a lot of text. And let us jump into um, uh, this um, uh, publication that I um, have the privilege to uh, present today. What you see uh, here are the two covers of the two volumes. And I, I already received some uh, interesting critique on it that says Angkor Wat and volume one says Angkor in France. But now you understand what I want to say because what you have on the, on the cover is a 1931 colonial exhibition. And on the right side, you see Angkor in Cambodia as a jungle find, I call it in French colonial period, who a global icon of world heritage, what it is today. What I want to do, of course, is not to give you all the all the chapters and all the all the all the results, but I want to highlight seven. I want to call them contact zone. You know this term, of course, by Marie Louise Pratt from the 1990s already. But I want to say that um, there are moments when Asia and Europe, Cambodia and let's say France, um, Angkor Wat um, came in contact by the different uh, modes of representations across time borders and across uh, political regimes. And I want to do the uh, structure this in two parts. One is on France and one is on Cambodia. So let's start the presentation with uh, the storyline, the official storyline. And it has to be, of course, questions when we go into what's the origin of a site, when it was so-called discovered, etc. has always a starting point in the Western narrative of art history. And 
the narrative here is this uh, so-called Mekong exploratory mission that um, uh, that um, has been um, has been um, uh, uh, then carried out in the 1860s. But I want to start with one uh, text that is really important for us because it was pr produced by a so-called naturalist Henri Mouault, but he was commissioned back then by the uh, British uh, Royal Geographic Society traveling to Indochina, uh, in interestingly. And he produced a book that was first published in, um, uh, in, um, in, um, uh, in English and then actually translated into French. And it was uh, uh, published here uh, in this text that I can show you. And uh, uh, he is explaining his moment of aesthetically discovering the site for the same time, for first moment when he was in Cambodia in 1860. And he said, what kind of beautiful building this has been in the past, how then generate and in ruins it is in the presence. And he's already speculating uh, who had been uh, might have been the, the the architect of it, and but because he does not know, he gives us a typical framing of grandeur of importance, and says it has to be erected by some Oriental Michelangelo. So you see that the framing is giving a an architect, an artist from Italian Renaissance, to give importance to what he sees here and coming to terms gradually on a site that has been never been uh, explored by Europeans before. Um, and he says this, uh, this situation is now embedded in a state of barbarism and needs regeneration. And this regeneration is then in the next sentence, which is rarely quoted in historiography, um, directly related to European conquests. And he says that France should possess this land and then reestablish this magnificent jewel of uh, this crown. Um, and here we are into colonialism and we are also in the World Heritage Agenda and uh, what James Clifford called the eternal salvage paradigm. And this is the starting point. You would see that the Mekong exploratory mission made uh, by, by navigators, botanists, um, geographers, etc., along the Mekong into China, um, they um, they um, been searching a trade route into China, but as a detour only, they stopped at Angkor and took this photograph on the staircase towards Angkor Wat. You would see this uh, male, of course, narrative of four explorators sitting on the staircase towards Angkor Wat. What came out of it is a publication that was delayed and came out in 19, uh, in 1871. I show you a one illustration on the right side, which has been published in this. So what do you see here is a kind of continuation of Moore's um, storyline that the site is in ruins. You see the frame here on the end ruins and of course the local people are sitting there as a kind of framed as an as a, as a ignorant kind of populace that are not directly related to the spot in the typical religious kind of uh, moment and so you can see this uh, duality of 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 um, decay and uh, the glorious site in the background uh, in reality, uh, the first photograph ever been uh, produced had been made by a Scott photographer Joel called John Thompson in 1867. You can see it on the lower side here. It's the first photograph. And what you see here is that site is not as overgrown by nature as, as this illustration wants to give us. Uh, that on the left side, you see uh, some wooden huts. And if you go on the upper left side, a photograph that was never published, but made on the same moment in time during the exhibition, uh, expo um, exploratory mission by a French photographer called Emile Xel, you would see that in front of the building, there's a full intact Buddhist monastery. So actually the storyline would go into a perfectly maintained Buddhist monastery, whereas on the right side, you would kind of more have the impression of, of, of decadence, decay, ruin, and the implied storyline of um, um, European conquest to recover, to restore, and to map out the site. Uh, one uh, in the typical bazaar aesthetics uh, back then in France, uh, I've been discovering giant watercolors in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Uh, by Lucien Fournero, who was an important architect back then. And he um, did these watercolors in a, this typical picturesque, exotic, exoticized ruin storyline, where you would see elements of Angkor standing around in large uh, uh, scale, whereas the 
the active Buddhist monks on the spot are very small. So you would know what the hierarchy is between archaeology and religious practice back on the spot where through the eyes of Bozar architects and um, painters. Uh, so in the next step, um, of course, um, in the moment when um, Indochina got gradually into, into uh, possession of, of the French, um, uh, we know this from the British uh, in, in, in India, etc. you want to have um, elements of this architecture, artifacts in European museums in the center of power. And I think this uh, photograph shows this as uh, uh, the, 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 on, the, on the right side, maybe a French uh, uh, explorer, it might be Louis de la Porte, I will come back to him, and uh, might reflect like here standing on, you know, leaning on this giant uh, uh, stone, thinking of my, how, how the hell we can bring such an enormous piece of architecture here in the a Buddhist uh, ruin uh, tower uh, in the territory of Angkor, uh, probably from the uh, 13th century. Uh, bring uh, this uh, into uh, France museums, which is certainly not possible in this scale. And what happens in the first step is that little elements, um, um, artifacts, mobile artifacts, original stone artifacts like statues had been taken out from temples, produced and transported, as you can see in Louis de la Porte's, he was an amateur and explorator back in time, uh, amateur in the best sense of the word, um, he's been involved in the first uh, missions uh, to the spot and to try to bring um, original artifacts into French museums. And here you on the right side, you see one uh, of the, the first French uh, museum in Compiègne where original Cambodian artifacts had been on display. So here you see a first moment of translocation of original artifacts. But how do you mobilize architecture that is in French and German also called immobilier? So you assume that architecture is immobile and static on a spot. But if you want to mobilize it in a, in a, in a regime, like for example, colonialism, you have to apply a certain technique of translation to make it transportable, to make it translatable. And this is plaster cast. Plaster cast course has been applied long time before the 19th century but what I show you here there are different moments when a plaster cast techniques have been applied on the upper left side in the in the moment process of artistic um, creation of um, a one-to-one -one scale uh, like of copying um, 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 humans um, and then on the right side, we are already in this contested field of anthropology, ethnography, where, for example, here, um, um, Oceanian um, um, people had been uh, produced as plaster casts and, and put into comparative uh, lines of, 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 of display in uh, European museums. But the same was already on place in um, uh, museums for architecture. Here on the lower side, you see a rare uh, postcard from the Louvre, where on the left, on the right side of this photograph, you would see the Nike de Samotraque, which is still one of the most important original artifacts in the Louvre Museum. But on the left side, you would see a full scale plaster cast replica of a, of a temple site in, in uh, present day uh, Turkey. So you would see in a certain moment around or before 1900, plaster casting was also considered a technique to represent originality and materiality. This has been changed uh, uh, during the 20th century and now gradually come back. I will come back to this, um, this moment when plaster casts are currently rediscovered. So what happens when you want to produce an Indo-Chinese museum? You have to bring it into a specific uh, building. The building here has been the Trocadero Palace, what you can see on the upper, um, upper um, illustration, um, uh, which on the, from our perspective on the right side, there has been the Musée de Sculpture Comparée, so the Museum of Comparative Sculpture where um, Claude Billy Le Duc, a famous uh, architect and art historian or architecture historian, had installed in the medium of plaster casts, an art historical, architectural historical um, parkour where you would walk from the 12th or 9th, 10th, 12th century French architecture from one uh, period in time to another, from one room to the other. In his first room, what you see on the lower left side, he confronted 
uh, the moment of a transition of a late Roman to uh, early Gothic architecture in Rome, uh, in, in France, in uh, with the early, what he called uh, formative periods around the globe by, for example, confronting it with um, Egyptian um, 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 artifacts uh, that you see on this catalog on the right side. So already he tried to do kind of a global entangled uh, storyline in architectural history. But what was, was just uh, discovered some years ago is that on the other end of the of the of the of this giant building, there had been uh, the Musée Andochinois installed from the 1880s onwards by this amateur Louis de Laporte. And you would see uh, on the left, lower left side understand the kind of parallel making of of bringing artifacts um, or architectural elements in the medium of plaster casts being installed in this comparative displays. And uh, what he did, not only putting a little elements as originally kind of scaled plaster cast replicas, but what he also did is to bring architectural elements and put them into a fantastic montage and bricolage into freestanding architectural objects. So you would see how plaster casts in detail are transported into France and then recast and reconstituted into freestanding architectural elements. And this has two different um, strategies. On the right hand side, what I would call a kind of a direct translation, physical translation, you would see the entry Original Western entry gate, um, Western entry gate to Angkor Wat as a kind of a section, let's say, aesthetics on the left side, a fantastic um, Buddhist uh, 13th century architecture being fabricated uh, by little so called authentic or let's say full scale um, plaster cast elements, but then poured into a building that has never been produced on the spot. <laughs> So what I want to say you uh, tell you is because we focus on Angkor Wat is here on the left side a publication from 1890s where I just by accident discovered that you would actually on the photograph see how uh, a little scaffolding on bamboo sticks was made by for someone going getting up to the pediment and then creating a plaster cast of exactly the scene that you see in the museum it is Krishna killing killing Kamsa we will come to this element in my storyline. And uh, uh, in the ninth, in the, uh, uh, some years ago, I went back to the temple, uh, crawling on this very spot and taking photographs for you to compare what has been cast or uh, eventually replaced. And interestingly, I found another photograph for this um, um, uh, display mode of a global architectural history, in a sense. Uh, in the Musée Indochinois and in the Musée de Sculpture Comparé, because what you see on the left side is the first, the last room of the of of the French comparative sculpture museum. Finally, maybe with the son, the son of the guardian uh, uh, sitting here, holding his hand, you know, <laughs> in this moment, in the mouth of the famous Marseillaise, which is one of the most important sculptural achievements in uh, German in, in French art. A monumental art on the Arc de Triomphe. But what's important is that you go on the same spot, cross the threshold on the left side on this photograph, and then you walk into French Indochina. So you see how close French art history and Indochinese representations of architecture came into a contact zone, just divided by a threshold. And then you walk through to this door and come to the photograph that uh, the room that is uh, depicted here in the photograph on the right side. But that was not enough because what uh, I can uh, worked out in my book is that this Musée Andochinois with thousands of plaster casts became a kind of a repository of architectural elements when um, um, important architects responsible for uh, universal and colonial exhibitions went to and asked De Laporte to give him this and this element and this column, and then they were multiplied ad infinitum and merged into freestanding pavilions. Because, and this is why you, the first um, um, volume of my book is called From Plaster Cast to Exhibition Pavilions. And what I mean with this can only be short glimpses into the book, but here you will see um, um, how plaster cast works. I found actually the original firm 
that was multiplying the casts, the plaster cast surfaces from Louis de la Porte's museum. You see one little element still um, being visible in the, in the showroom of the firm, still existing in Paris, uh, on this elephant um, scene where the famous uh, Cambodian king of the 12th century was conquering uh, neighbors. Uh, and, and you would see that these plaster casts are uh, produced at infinitum and then merged into a new architecture. So I would want to remind you on this moment of casting uh, the pediment of Angkor Wat because we will see it now on a career in French universal and colonial exhibitions. And um, uh, what a curator of the Musée Guinée, I will come back to this museum, found actually um, um, some years ago was exact plaster cast made around uh, 1880s stored in the archive of um, the Musée Guinée today. But in these plaster cast um, pavilions to kind of first, uh, in the first step here, you would see the Pagode de Dancor in the Exposition Universelle in Paris of 1889, is that the Angkor Wat is kind of hybridized and just exoticized in a small scale object where, but at least you would see the uh, the, the pediment that we have been showing you before re-employed by this fantastic representation. Why would you want to bring Angkor or Angkor Wat or a style quote of this into the French capital? It means that you want to bring um, an object from the colonial territories far away into the center of power in France, in Paris, to show it to the public and to be fascinated about what the French and endeavor into Indochina had been already gaining knowledge for and then of course uh, researching and, and, and bringing what they think benefit to this area. It's a kind of visual propaganda in a sense. And this continues in another uh, national colonial exhibition, for example, in Marseille in 1906, in a very different uh, mode when you remember these two um, pavilions in the Louis de la Porte Museum de Chinois with the face towers. And here the Angkor Wat pediment and the face towers are merged into another um, exotic, exotic um, um, pavilion structure. On the left side, you see a postcard. And this continues until a very crucial moment of 1907. What happens in 1907 is that the territory of Angkor, which up to this point belonged to Siam, so to today Thailand, you would see a map on the left side that exactly shows you the frontier line between the original, the, uh, the already French colonial territory on the right side on Indochina, so in Cambodia, and on the left side, a territory which is largely unknown back then by the cartographers, already indicating Angkor Wat, you would see it here on, the, on, the, on, the, on this thing. What happens in 1907 is that this territory originally belonging to Cambodia had been uh, given back from Siam into Cambodia by diplomatic pressure and discussions. And that was then of course already uh, French colonial territory. And what happens just years after is just by comparing these two maps is that the knowledge, the geographic, archaeological, art historical knowledge on the temple sites on the very same spot had been um, multiplied uh, uh, in these uh, few years. And you would just compare these two maps, you would see that now Angkor is totally mapped and all the red dots are temples identified on the territory. And this enormous gain of knowledge on the original spot had dramatic consequences for the representation of Angkor back in France. And this is the other point when already a general conservator of Angkor had been institutionalized. His name was Jean Coray. And he did sketches that I found in the, in the archives in Paris, where he really went into details of the tower construction and sent it back to France, where at the same moment in 1914, an architect called um, uh, De Laval was um, responsible for the next Angkor style have the Exposition Coloniale Nationale in Marseille in 1922. And you will see now that the fantastic kind of vague, exoticized fantasy object from the earlier exhibitions now became 
way more detailed, way more into scale. And the representation here was already almost full scale, but that was 1922. Of course, the exhibition was postponed due to uh, First World War, but it was made in 22 in Marseille. And this is a result of it on the lower side. And the culminating point, is 1931 and now you already have seen the original aerial photograph on this exhibition where for six months uh, France and other uh, colonial powers um, represented their overseas possessions in full scale or hybridized small scale replica pavilions where Angkor Wat, you would now see it on the lower left side, was on display along the Avenue des Colonies, so the French colonies, uh, for six months only. But now I will come to the point of how it was created, because of course, as you know, Angkor Wat is a 12th century, a solid stone temple, um, uh, was not replicated for six months in full stone, of course, but it was uh, produced as a visual representation on a wooden, wooden interior scaffolding and where these lightweight plaster cast plates had been attached to, to create the visual experience of it. So coming back to what, what you have seen in the first uh, slides here, now we are seeing uh, maybe 1931 colonial exhibition and the issue what is an original and what is a copy in different perspective because in a sense, on both spots in Paris and in Cambodia, Angkor Wat is a real element. It's physically there, it's experienceable, it's touchable and um, it's, 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 it's reality. So how do we treat this um, in our conception of what an original is, what architecture is, what authenticity is, and origin and, and or centers and peripheries are? This is a, a question that I want to see uh, and that I've been investigating in my book. In the second part, I argue that in a sense, these representations in France from the 1880s onwards had created a certain image, a certain imaginaire, a certain expectation towards grandeur, towards the original. So what I call in my introduction on, on the method of translation and back translation is that this impression of grandeur, of authentic, of aesthetic quality of the site of Angkor Wat had been reapplied as an aesthetic frame on the so-called original back in Cambodia. So of course the temple site is a site that it's way larger, which is a religious until today Buddhist religious site. But what I see is that the conception of what cultural heritage should be is created in Paris, in France, and then reapplied on the original. And this ongoing, um, also this conflict between a religious object and its cultural heritage uh, um, commodification is an ongoing uh, debate and uh, ongoing conflict until today on the very same spot, as you know, if you had been in Cambodia. So in the second part, I will uh, give you some short glimpses into actually what happens on the Cambodian side along my storyline. What is first of all important for all um, explorations is the putting on the map. As Muo said, coming to terms was a problem to describe the Oriental Michelangelo as the architect. Here, cartographers try to put this terra incognita on a map. This is the first strategy of appropriation. You have to give it a name, you have to give it a space, you have to give it um, um, a taxonomy and a visual representation, and one is the map. So on the upper left side, you see the first maps produced in the 1870s on the side, where you would see that Angkor Wat here is largely, largely embedded in a territory which is blank. It's because you just don't know what is there. And by studying the different archeological maps, for example, here around 1900, you would see that step by step, archeologists and geographers would kind of map and uh, uh, put uh, temple sites into relation to each other and create the story of art history on the very spot. Of course, aerial photography was not yet um, uh, invented and possible technically involved, but so the first guidebooks or first um, art history books on the site were pure fantastic representations 
um, uh, not uh, directly relating to uh, to what Angkor Wat uh, would be in uh, the central uh, axis from east to west um, by different crossing different gates by um, embedded into a, um, a concentric uh, water a water system um, with a bridge and going through the territory to the uh, inner um, um, architectural space towards the uh, inner temple site, which has been represented uh, here. In the next step, you kind of uh, give uh, the site a certain um, uh, publicity. So the history of guidebooks of uh, the um, starting um, um, cultural tourism um, uh, to the spot is very interesting to study. On the upper left side, it was uh, Jean Comay, the first archeologist on the spot, or the first general conservator of the area uh, to produce the first guidebook um, in, I think it was um, in, um, eight, in 1912. Um, and then you would kind of slowly come to aerial photography in the 1920s by uh, vertical um, horizontal photographs and put them on the lower left side, uh, put them together and giving a, 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 getting a picture of the territory, measured distances, putting on a map, and then creating a parkour, a way of how to circulate uh, as a Western visitor through the spot, which is not a God-given fact. You have to create a parkour. And if you go to Angkor, you would until today use the Grand and Petit Circuit that has been created for you in the 1920s by the institution that has been created for uh, taking care of the site to research artifacts uh, uh, in, in Indochina. It was the Ecole Française d'Extreme Orient, which is still uh, operational today in post-colonial period. So having an idea of the map, you see some discussions um, on uh, how the protective parameters around the temple site should be created on the left side. Is this a uh, very important moment of 1925-31 when the archaeological park of Angkor had been artificially created and institutionalized? So what you cannot maybe see on the map here uh, through uh, the, our Zoom presentation is that there is this precise red line saying what is inside and what is outside, what is protected, what is not protected, what is explorable and visible by visitors and what is not. And this has direct uh, um, effects uh, for the local population because on the overall territory, there are still um, living monasteries and also little villages, which are then of course, highly affected by this commodification strategies to tourism until today. But what you want to have is a picture perfect temple site. So studying the uh, daily and weekly and monthly uh, sketchbooks uh, by Louis de, um, by Jean Comay from the uh, from 197 onwards shows you um, that he wants to produce what in the 1930s becomes a picture perfect archaeological site of an originally Hinduist building. Uh, which by then was, was already Buddhist, but what they what the French want is an archaeological representation of the spot. So you would on the lower left side see these sketches where um, Louis de la uh, where uh, Jean Comay was originally uh, mapping out the bonzerie, so the monastery, on the spot. But on the next side, in the next moment, when they create a little hotel here, a bungalow, they he's already indicating the view of the tourists towards the spot. And to appreciate it as an archaeological ruin, the monastery has been relocated uh, 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 in, in around the area uh, here uh, until today. So you want to have this archaeological vista that you know from the Forum Romanum in Rome, et cetera, et cetera. So the building history, the, create, the history to create an archaeological park has been a large chapter in my book. And uh, the left uh, photograph here is from the 1960s. And you would see that almost every stone that you would walk on today has already been moved once. And in some elements, you also see that the passageway towards the temple, which you see on the left hand uh, side, and this is the entry gate in the other direction, but doesn't matter, has been dismantled, fortified with reinforced concrete, and then put on the top. So if you walk the temple site today, you are on the spot of a 12th century temple, of course, but critically, you're also on a site of 
an archaeological motivation of the 19th and 20th century. So keep this in mind if the next time you walk through the temple site. But this has been the, the uh, kind of a colonial or let's say post-colonial critique only. But uh, of course, as you know, Cambodia becomes independent in 1953. And what happens in this moment? Interestingly, all the taxonomies of grandeur, of deep history, of origins, of the golden age of Angkor had been fused into the official national narrative of independent Cambodia with the king a ruling king uh, or Sihanouk. And what he's doing is, is to make it short as a storyline, to reinvent himself in the lineage of the Cambodian kings, going back to the French colonial made archeological park to represent himself as the new king of Angkor of the 20th century. You see a publication from the 1950s here where he is wearing a kind of reinvented traditional costumes um, on the central plaza of Angkor Thom, which is a city planning of the 13th until 14th, 15th century, where he is uh, creating a state ceremony of the mid 20th century in disguise and the storyline of the Cambodian kings of the 12th and 13th century. This is a fantastic moment of how colonial taxonomies are appropriated for independent nation states. You might see this in Egypt, or in Mexico in other countries as well, of course. And a very interesting moment here, you would see the visit of Charles de Gaulle, so the, 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 the big politician, state leader of France, coming as a state visit to a formerly colonial site of Le Cambodge, now Cambodia. And they are doing a sound and light show in front of Angkor Wat where thousands of disguised um, actors are cre recreating the glorious medieval period of Angkor Wat. You would see a publications here from the 1950s where the, the leader of the former colonial power is sitting to, uh, next to the king of Cambodia enjoying what French uh, archaeologists had been brought back by uh, uh, architectural uh, reconstruction and restoration. And of course you would be reminded in 1966 on the same moment of a colonial exhibition of 1931, where the same, let's say, sound and light representation of grandeur had already been in play, but 30 years early in a totally different site and different political regime. But Cambodia is also one of the um, post-colonial nations, independent nations in Asia, which really created one of the best architectures ever in post-colonial period. Um, um, in architecture uh, by uh, an architect called Van Molivan. I will not go into detail in this, but what they also do besides the modernist uh, architects in the name of Angkor, they're producing their uh, state um, memorial of independence, independence memorial in the stylistic continuation of architecture, of course, going back to uh, early uh, Cambodian architecture. But now, as you know, in the 1970s, 90s, 80s and 90s, Cambodia is facing a very, very dramatic moment in its modern history. A period of uh, civil war, genocide, autogenocide, occupation. And in this role, um, very little research has been done until today about the role of Angkor and Angkor Wat in these changing um, stories and changing uh, regimes over the country. And in my book, I will do this, I call it competing heritage claims because all of these regimes are appropriating the story of Angkor Wat for their political purpose in the presence. That's why the temple has been largely protected and not being destroyed despite of the warfare that had been uh, happening around. So just uh, 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 to show you the different flags from French colonial period into independence uh, in the 1970s, then uh, the Marxistic uh, Mao, uh, Ma Maoist um, uh, Khmer Rouge to Vietnamese occupation in this revolutionary red golden background into independence until today, you would see that the stylized silhouette of Angkor Wat has been appropriated uh, 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 along the way of 150 years. 
And in the Khmer Republic, it was a moment of uh, civil war um, by American-backed uh, troops uh, by Lonol against uh, the French, uh, the, the earlier uh, Sihanouk establishment. And this is photograph of the refugees hiding in their most secure spot, which is the galleries of Angkor Wat. In the Khmer Rouge period, when um, in, um, uh, the, the Maoist ideology migrated into Cambodia and um, 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 some of the intellectuals being trained in France, of course, um, appropriate this um, 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 Marxistic ideology for a highly autogenocidic um, regime under Pol Pot, he is um, here in the center, um, to establish a terror regime over, over the country. Um, they even uh, produced money with Angkor Wat on the, on the one side, but this money was of course never being produced because what the Khmer Rouge wanted to make the story short is to bring Cambodia back into um, uh, the glorious medieval period by purifying the country from negative Western influence. And that's why this autogenocide, this dramatic autogenocide happened where all the overall, the all uh, Cambodian um, intelligentsia was murdered and killed. A traumatic, very traumatic moment in the history. In the very same moment in the 70s and 80s, uh, Cambodian refugees all over the planet, here you would see a journal in the US where they create their journals and discuss their traumatic experience and question on the lower right side, are 2000 years of Khmer culture will be extinguished. And you will see the Khmer Rouge hand to go over Uncle Wat and taking out the roots of culture and identity of the Cambodian people. In the Vietnamese occupation from over Cambodia in the 1980s, uh, the only important um, regime to acknowledge the Vietnamese occupation was India. And to make this short, uh, story short is that um, as a diplomatic gift of political recognition of the country, India, through its archaeological regime of the archaeological survey of India, was, as I want to call it, kind of rewarded to restore their prime element of a culture, which is Angkor Wat. So you see in the 80s, 1980s, these publications, like ongoing uh, restoration efforts by the Indians as a diplomatic return gift, I want to say. While the Cambodians, uh, the Khmer Rouge themselves had been a UN acknowledged, recognized exile government. And I went through uh, certainly like 50 meters of archives um, in, in the UNESCO archive in Paris to see how this UN recognized Khmer Rouge people had appropriated the cultural heritage discourse over Angkor to uh, get back power over the country. To, to say, well, please install us back for this, uh, in Cambodia because we want to protect the temples. A mimicked, uh, let's say, rhetorics from UNESCO in the 1980s, of course. But uh, this is a very important moment here. And you would see this PR material from the Khmer Rouge uh, in, in Paris at the same moment when the stamps, the official stamps of the Democratic, uh, Kabuchia Democratic was the Khmer Rouge, uh, using the same iconography towards Angkor Wat with a smoking uh, factory here in the neorealistic kind of attitudes of, of Marxistic uh, ideology. I will come to the to the last slides now, and I want to say that um, around 1990, uh, when um, peace talks had been um, fostered, and uh, finally um, the, the Vietnamese um, uh, left the country, uh, the UN installed a helping structure to bring Cambodia back into a peace. Uh, to, um, uh, to be again an ind uh, independent um, um, uh, country. And, but this has high, uh, strong effects on the, again, again, the reworking of the cultural heritage storyline over Angkor Wat. And I uh, have a question um, uh, whether, or raise the question whether this world heritage debate, which comes up now, I'll show you some slides at the end, is kind of related to the World Heritage, uh, World Fair Universal Exhibition logics, which now come back onto Angkor Park itself. I want to show you here the crucial moment when the General um, uh, Secretary of, um, of UNESCO 
um, um, Federico Mayor here in the center holds a speech of saving Angkor for humanity and asks uh, international community to come to Cambodia to protect the site, which is of course a very important moment for Cambodia. And one year later, this, the park was listed on World Heritage, but in danger in terms of the moment of saying, um, we have to protect it, but we know that it has to be restored before it comes back to uh, the full perfect list and heritage um, and tourism. And this reminds me critically, again, on the moment when in front of, let's say, reconstituted Angkor Wat, the central element, the central person to tell the story is not, is again, not a Cambodian, but on the upper right side, it was actually uh, George, the future uh, British King George VI on, on visit uh, on the colonial exhibition in Paris. And here it's a um, Spanish um, politicians as the general director of UNESCO holding the speech to salvage Angkor. I know it's a critical uh, debate, but I think there is a neo-colonial moment in the storyline. And um, this is why I produced an edited volume on this issue. It's called the Civil uh, Cultural Heritage a Civilizing Mission, where you now you know the, the illustration, the, the eternal salvage paradigm under James Clifford's idea is recycled through different regimes over the spot. And I asked whether uh, you would see a, 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 a map of Angkor Park in 2010, where um, the different nations, Great Britain, America, US, uh, USA, France, Germany, um, Italy, all the way to China and, um, and uh, Indonesia and, and Japan are installed over the territory of Angkor Park to take care of individual pavilions, I want to say. And critically, how far are we from the storyline of yeah, of colonial exhibition in Paris, where again, nations around the planet represent heritage that it did not originally belong to these countries, but caring for them, representing them, appropriating them in the best sense. So it is a success story of an international efforts of, of help, but it's in another uh, critically had been discussed under the neo-colonial regime of UNESCO's endeavor here over the spot. And um, just to continue here, the ICC Angkor uh, is the, in um, the international coordination committee over the territory of Angkor Park. You see here monks on this cover, publica the publication of the cover, a cover of the publication in 2010 to celebrate 15 years of this international help structure. And again, you would have these Buddhist monks uh, kind of as a picturesque um, decoration for actually the ICC structure. No, no Buddhist monk on the spot would care about international cooperation of conservation because that's not their regime. They are religious people caring for the monasteries. And I ask, of course, critically, how far are we now from a collage like this, where again, ruins and living heritage in terms of caring Buddhist monks has been a visual narrative that has been migrating from the 19th into the 21st century. And a book that I produced out of this as an edited volume is the question of archeologizing heritage, an edited volume uh, from 2013. And I come to the last slides here. You would see what happens today in a mode of over tourism and over, you know, scenario of uh, sound and light shows over the spot for tourism has, of course, a certain continuation to, for example, this colonial fair in 1931. Another point is important uh, in, uh, you remember my first chart when I discussed how dynamic our taxonomies, our applied value structures over art and artifacts is. What you would see on the upper right side here is a photograph that I took for the museum, ex for the exhibition in the Musée Guimet in Paris in 2013. In a very interesting moment, original artifacts from the area brought by Delaporte and others had been confronted with the restored plaster casts that survived 
from the world and colonial exhibitions. And now um, I would say that the, the, the you know, um, secondary source of castes in the colonial period became primary sources of a storyline of collecting and caring uh, uh, of the colonial period. And they are placed side by side. And it's a taxonomically a very interesting um, uh, um, uh, moment in, uh, in the changing paradigms over originals and, and copies and artifacts. But that would only uh, be a half of the storyline. And I just want to show you four slides before I end, I promise. It's, of course, we could play the bad story of, you know, Europeans appropriating things and being the bad guys through periods of time and the bad UNESCO and all this. But that's, of course, just half the story. Because there has been an appropriation of Angkor Wat in the inner Asian trans-regional moments. And I won't just give you two moments, there are others, which you have to remind is one that already in the 1860, when the territory of Angkor still belonged to Siam, the replication strategy to represent a peripheral element of culture here in religious patronage had been appropriated to be brought to bring Angkor Wat through the medium of replication into the very center of power, which back then was, was Bangkok. And you would see in 1860, you could steal it today. I took a photograph here in 2012. A small replica of Angkor Wat in the very royal palace of Bangkok produced here the replica of 1860. So our frame starts also with, um, with the Siamese modes of representation of, of Angkor Wat. And it ends, and that's interesting, in another storyline where uh, the, uh, a giant uh, um, uh, Hindu sect in India uh, is planning, I don't know where they stand today, to say that they want to bring their grandest temple of the Hindus, there's a quote from 2012 here in the upper right side, they are standing uh, their grandest temple thousands of miles away from Cambodia to the homeland of Hinduism by not only replicating Angkor Wat, but making it even larger and more grand grandeur as a as a as a as a site of um, Hinduist um, uh, um, um, veneration, and this created a large uh, uh, discussion also online, etc. I discussed this in my book, where, for example, a Cambodian spokesman said, "A shameful act to replicate this in India. Angkor Wat is Angkor Wat is unique," and he says. We won't let anyone confuse the world that there are two Angkor Wats. Well, we know today that there are many more than two Angkor Wats. They had already 20 Angkor Wats circulating the continents, the regimes, the cultural, uh, political programs, our different disciplines from art history to archaeology, etc. So to conclude, what I wanted to show you with so many slides, I apologize for this, but I hope that you could see just by the um, storyline of all the visual material that this temple, of course, still is a 12th century today Buddhist monastery of regional pilgrimage, but it's also been a product of a transcultural trajectory in the name of cultural heritage. So we started here with Henri Mouault in 1860. We continued with the Ecole Française Extreme Orient in the 1910s to produce it, to make it uh, an archaeological site. We go to the representation in the Paris 1931 exhibition. We come to the moment when the previous colonial power of France is on visit in the independent Cambodia, creating a sound and light show in front of the original. We continue by also not a, 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 um, um, forgetting the, the non-political voices of the refugees in this very uh, difficult period for Cambodia in the 1970s and 80s spread all over the world. We continued by the very moment when Angkor became an, an, an element in the specific cultural heritage regime of UNESCO. And we concluded the issue that it's not only a West East, a Europe Asian storyline, also continues to be an appropriation storyline also within Asia. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Michael, for that wonderful talk um, and so many wonderful images as well that illustrate it. <laughs> so many. It's just marvellous to see all of that um, archival um, work that you've done kind of brought together in, in such a wonderful way. And I have to also, you know, congratulate you on your publication of not one, but two volumes um, on Angkor Wat, which, you know, I think, you know, uh, it makes such an important contribution to the last um, sort of our understanding of the last sort of century and a half uh, of, of the temple's history. Um, and I think what your, your what your talk today did was really um, remind us of the dynamism of of Angkor Wat as a site. Um, you know, moving from this idea of the the kind of decaying ruin, um, the, the symbolic of a degenerate civilization. If we want to kind of think about the kind of late nineteenth century, all the whole kind of um, sort of imagination of the site, um, but something that is dynamic and that is um, you know. Uh, 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 something to be restored and, and then something that, that changes throughout um, various contexts. I mean, I thought um, what might be might be helpful um, for, for those of us who are in the audience who maybe are, are less familiar with Cambodian historiography is maybe to sort of um, uh, bridge the gap very quickly between the, the 12th century um, and, and the late 19th century where, where your talk really, really picked up. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you spoke um, very much about this idea that Am uh, Angkor is somehow forgotten and, and abandoned, um, you know, very much implanted in the European imagination through, um, through these um, expeditions in the late, late 19th century, which go in tandem with the, the rise in sort of travel literature and that interest in Europe in, in sort of reading travel journals and guides, tourism, the colonial exhibitions, so on. And, and then moving into then the early 20th century where European scholarship on, on the temples, on Cambodia is very much focused on the temples itself. So the EFO's remit, um, although, although broad, certainly in Angkor very much focuses in, or in Cambodia, sorry, focuses in on, on the Angkorian period. So very interested, you know, this scholarship is very interested in translating the Sanskrit inscriptions, establishing chronologies, the temples establishing, um, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of evolution of style in order to kind of get this kind of names and dates history, which I think goes alongside what you were saying about cartography and the importance of the map. Uh, and I think also the importance of naming, uh, naming kings, naming temples, getting a sense of, 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 of chronology as, as we understand it in Europe. Um, was also very important, and I think understandable for these um, these scholars. When you look for those of us who've been to Angkor, there are hundreds of these temples, so it, it kind of makes sense that they are going to be one of the first things that that one focuses on. Um, but you know, as you said, when you're you know, as you pointed out with the work that happened um, in Angkor in terms of the the causeway, you know, the the, the concrete concrete and reinforcing the causeway and you said you know you're walking not only in the 12th century site you're walking on the 20th century archaeological site but also you're walking on a 15th 16th century site as well um, and one of the things I think that the the uh, you know early European scholarship on Angkor early 20th century um, scholarship much less attention was paid to the post Angkorian period or what we might call the middle period of Cambodian history um, and we know that whilst the, the royal capital moved south, Angkor was still um, a significant site to varying degrees over this period, but certainly kings returned, um, temples were modified to suit uh, Buddhist orientation, not only Angkor Wat, but other temples as well, but Angkor Wat was obviously the, the key temple in all of this. Um, while at the same time the Hindu the, the original Hindu elements are largely largely kept as well. So there's something something about tolerance there that I find quite interesting. You know, mm, as, as, that's right. as, as things develop, um, something maybe you know, trans, a, a kind of question of transculturalism within Cambodia, um, not only within within Asia. And then I'm thinking also of sort of um, Ashley Thompson's work on um, the middle period, particularly thinking about. A citation of the four faces of the bion. Um, that's something I also work on. So for those of you who maybe are less familiar, the bion is a late 12th century 
um, Angkorian temple built by the first Buddhist king of Angkor, and he happened to be the last great king of Angkor as well. Um, but it's composed of these giant face towers, each face is looking out um, at the cardinal directions. And you can then see a kind of um, citation of these face towers, um, or these four faces in, in various other moments throughout Cambodian history. And for those of you who've been to Phnom Penh, you see the four faces at the top of uh, the Royal Palace in Phnom Penh as well. And so there's a way in which we see, I suppose, how Cambodians were doing history. Um, but in a very different way, less concerned perhaps with names and dates and maps and, and those kind of things, but certainly interested in referencing Angkor, remembering Angkor, um, um, interested in those in those kind of cultural aspects. And you know, Angkor what was a pilgrimage site um, where it certainly had kind of international visitors throughout throughout this little period. Um, and so I think you know your talk, your your work, and your talk kind of I think then contributes as well to our understanding of um, these aspects of Cambodian history that have been uh, given much much less attention, or that are now being revealed through through scholarly work that kind of aligns with your own work. So I'm thinking, for example, of um, the the archaeological work of Damien Evans and his team with lidar, which is which has exposed through kind of looking down under the, into, the, into the ground, um, a sense of what the infrastructure would have looked like around the temples, a sense of how these temples would have been living spaces. Um, and this goes alongside, you know, the, the increasing scholarly interest in the middle period, um, the post Angkorian period as well. And I think these are kind of what I see your your kind of work, your meticulous work that you've done within the archives as and, and looking at bringing all this material together from the last hundred or so years is a work of kind of revealing um, what has otherwise mechanisms that were otherwise sort of hidden, um, ways in which the temple has been um, uh, instrumentalized um, through through different different moments by by different actors for, for different religious or ideological, political purposes. Purposes. Um, and so I see this as part of a kind of larger uh, question of, of what's what is being revealed and when and, and what are what privileges are at work in, in the kind of the choices of, of um, what we look at at the temple sites. And I think all of this work really has, under, you know, gives us a much deeper understanding of how our ideas, how Angkor Wat has shifted over time, how the complex has, you know, as I said, been um, instrumentalized from the Angkorian period through to today as well. You know, we must, I think, remember that kind of post-Angkorian middle period um, as, as being quite um, significant. Um, and I suppose what I'm also really interested in in your work and your talk is the way that we get a sense of all these different historiographies working, um, working together and, and, and what we might term a kind of colonialist mode of, of, of history of practice alongside a Cambodian or an indigenous mode of, 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 of history, of, of historiography. And what we see in the 20th century is how they become really intertwined and intermeshed. And we see that with the figure of Sihanouk, for example, who is, is kind of really um, referencing Angkor um, in a way that hadn't been done by, by kings really before. They were, you know, citing Angkor, there were continuities with Angkor, but you can see the influence then of, of kind of the European scholarship in place that Angkor had in the European imagination, um, impacting maybe, you know, Sihanouk's kind of representation of, of Angkor and himself, you know, as part of that, as part of that lineage. Um, and I suppose, you know, and I think that's one of these interesting things is this entanglement of, of different kind of, of histories. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking that when I was looking at the subtitles of your two volumes, you've got Angkor Wat in France and Angkor Wat in Cambodia, but I wondered to what extent, I suppose, um, there are complexities which those subtitles um, uh, uh, hide to some extent. And I, I know you go into that in the books, but, um, you know, there is a way of which I think those, those become complicated, right? The, the, the separation of Angkor in Europe or, or in Asia. Um, and I suppose the other thing that, that I was 
thinking about in your talk was the the way you work on Angkor in Asia exposes the mechanisms at play, the mechanisms, um, the flow between the colonial and the, the post-colonial um, contexts. And, you know, I suppose like, thinking about, um, you know, this idea of the ruin or static temple, you know, something that can be um, captured in plaster um, and through the plaster cast, you know, plaster by direct contact with the source, it sort of takes something up of, of the essence and can transport that of something. Um, you know, in the sense of kind of what, uh, what exceeds the boundaries of Angkor, what's visible, you know, we know that the temples of Angkor are very much bounded spaces from a religious cosmic cosmological point of view, they have enclosures and gateways and boundary markers, but they are also kind of unbounded in the sense they're on enlivened living monuments as well. And I think that question of, you know, intangible heritage um, maybe comes into play. Um, you know, you, you showed us lovely um, late 19th century photographs of the monastic community within the Angkorian complex and and I thought that was a fascinating um, drawing where you see the the eye line from the hotel well what's the vista that you're going to get of Angkor Wat and how do we you know improve on that or what needs to be done to change the space and and moving those monastic communities was was a part of that and I suppose that brings me to then thinking about something that's very central to us here at SOAS which is the question of decolonizing and where does all this come into to the, the larger discourses around decolonizing cultural heritage, decolonizing um, art history. Um, you know, part of this, where are the, the, where are the voices of the dispossessed? How can we re repossess their voices? You know, the local stakeholders, the local actors. Um, and I think when I think about what's being made visible, I think maybe the, the um, moment Angkor becomes a World Heritage Site, some of these debates become more visible. These debates about how the Angkor Park is, is used, how those communities that live there um, uh, interact with this now global heritage monument site. What are, you know, the, the, the real consequences, I think, for the people that live in that site became more visible. Um, so those debates around, um, you know, um, uh, because because you know there was real consequences for the people that lived on the site in terms of how they lived, how they worked, how they worshipped um, at the temples, um, and we saw that 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 debate happened much earlier on. We don't necessarily. I wonder about whether we hear the voices from those monastic communities um, in in the late nineteenth century, where where because I'm sure there was debate and, but, but where were those, you know, where were those voices? It seems that um, the, the process of, of the, world, the World Heritage process made those debates much more, much more visible, um, much, much louder. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just now wonder, I'm left to wonder, I suppose, what the next, you know, uh, iteration is of, <laughs> of the temple. I mean, this is not a question that we can answer, but perhaps for our audience, you know, thinking about, um, you know, we saw in your um, in your presentation on on the kind of way in which the, the French, particularly, but I know also you've worked kind of on, on German practices of displaying Angkor within their respective museums and institutions. We see the dynamics of, of kind of cultural capital play out and cultural capital um, as part of the colonialist um, project. And of course, cultural capital, as we see, is still a potent currency. Um, but then so is hard currency itself, you know, so is tourism. Um, you know, we see from the 1920s that impacts how we see Angkor, that still has real um, significant impacts on Angkor. Now, um, you know, I'm thinking about the proposed developments of a theme park right next door and, and what does what does this mean? And I think questions about capital, um, uh, commodity, commerce, all, all kind of come into to the site as well, and it's something maybe we we have to bear in mind as cultural historians and heritage professionals is, is that question of you know money as well at, at play in the site. And um, so yeah, I've talked quite a lot, I suppose. But those were some of just the the things that came out of your talk um, uh, as I was listening and, and your work more broadly. And um, you know, again, I have to thank you for today, and, and you know. Uh, congratulate you in the volume um but i know we have lots of questions um from the audience so i think this is probably a great time to um hand back to uh panga 
um, and take some questions from the virtual floor. Thank you very much. Yeah. While, while collecting the questions, I just wanted to um, add one thing. Of course, um, as, as, as uh, the, you know, the negative or the critical moments is when I compress the storyline into one hour, um, you might think that now I'm into this, you know, anti-UNESCO discourse and so on. And, and this is also too simple, of course, yeah. because first of all, um, and it's, I try to do this, uh, international structure to manage Angkor, the Cambodians with their institution um, of called Apsara um, are part of the discussion. So it's not a pure um, a colonial continuity. Of course, now Cambodians have a very important voice themselves. Uh, but uh, you see that in a sense, the independence towards, for example, resources, knowledge, money, technology. You mentioned LIDAR. I mean, these are techniques applied over, this, over the site, which are so costly that in a sense, the old colonial storyline of, well, we have to do because we have the money or we, I mean, we, we can't train people on the site, but uh, when it comes to a super technological, high, high resolution scans from aerial photography, this is, this is a heritage regime that had, is in itself always coming from the outside towards a developing country. And this is a crucial moment uh, when, um, when at the end once I had a, a, a local um, a worker from the FAO and he said, or from the Germans or the British or whatever, saying how many decades do we have to be trained by experts from outside to be finally responsible for Angkor. And this is, this is an interesting spot where sometimes I say, okay, oh, I am maybe part of it. I'm writing a book now in English, of course, and I can say I'm not fluent in, in Khmer or so. And uh, my storyline itself is uh, in itself by publishing and then excavating um, um, archival sources are, is in itself a, a continuation of this colonial paradigm. Maybe, maybe this is reality, you know? So I'm really conscious about my limits, limitations of my approach because I'm not a Buddhist monk or a Cambodian teacher. So that's, I just wanted to add this as a self critique in a way. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, um, Michael, for very fascinating slides. <laughs> you, you have presented us with a lot of visual, um, yeah, visuality that really encourage us to think more about Anchor and also uh, very insightful comments from uh, Joanna uh, uh, about the uh, how we should see this uh, image from colonial periods, post-colonial periods, uh, uh, national agenda and everything about Anchor. Um, I have personal question, Masco, but I know that we have a lot of questions uh, already in the Q&A box, so I just want to uh, bring up some of them. Uh, uh, we have a very limited time, so I don't know if we could go through them, but uh, let's start with actually quick question or maybe some basic questions uh, uh, from, oh, sorry, this would be anonymous attendee, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, it's about how do you define transcultural? I think this question for Michael then, because uh, the uh, the replica on on Paris on the expo exhibition in Paris is to show Angkor Wat as itself, but then it was not a mix with French style. It's not a French creations, and then how did then you define the element of transcultural then from 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 that view from that visuals, and um, maybe you can answer that first, Michael. Yeah, I mean. I could go back to the slide that I had at the beginning, but maybe that's, I don't know whether this is useful or you find it too difficult. Um, it's the, um, I could, I could uh, try to do. Um, do you see this, this the, 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 my, my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you see this slide now where I show this transcultural mode? Yes. Can, can you see that? Well, what I want to show 
physical reality of objects, of architects or architectures of artifacts, etc. But by exactly naming them artifacts, we are already applying a terminology that has been uh, primar primarily, I mean, first of all, it's in English, but then also the idea of an artifact is a framed entity by a discipline called art history. So what I wanted to show is this, this trans cultural is that even if the site stays until today a very important or maybe the primary most important religious site of, 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 of veneration in Cambodia, on the parallel side it has been um, created a heritage cultural heritage entity by the very naming um, uh, by the very terms that had been applied on it. So there is a physical reality, then it's a semantical reality. Then we have um, religious practice conf being confronted by uh, practices by, for example, museology, conservation sciences, archaeology. So different, different um, practices overlap over the site. So the trans means here that it, it's not either or, it's both at the same time. And it can also go beyond times and orders and borders. So it can be uh, a museum artifact in Paris, and at the same time, it can be venerated by a believing, a kind of a, a, a Buddhist um, pilgrim in the same very moment, and even within the French Museum or back in the spot. So it has been this simultaneous dynamics that are constantly being renegotiated by, by changing conceptual frames, by different actors, by different interests groups, by uh, who actually owns Angkor Wat today is a big question. Um, and this transcultural means that it is now a complex conglomeration of many different elements that are kind of creating a new reality. I mean, in, in cultural theory, in a certain moment, it has been called uh, third space. It has been it is not only an original Buddhist or let's say Hinduist and then Buddhist site. It's not yet a, only a piece of um, 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 Western um, disciplines. Now it's a third element. It's a third reality on the spot where different contexts, agencies, institutes, political regimes and terminologies overlap and create something that is simply a new reality which needs a new discipline and or a new framing and this uh, framing that I propose would have been this transcultural moment of it. I hope I could respond to your question. Yeah, I, I just I just want to let that answer with the question by Kyle Latinus actually. Uh, uh, so he actually tried to uh, have a, a con I mean, probably a concrete uh, disciplinary uh, approach of how, how then you see your project on Anchor. Is it, can we say that is it, is, it is art history or is uh -huh. it something else? Question. And if it is art history, then uh, maybe you would suggest that this is the kind of art history that we should do now uh, here in, in contemporary yeah. era. It's a good question. I mean, I, I was asked this sometimes, uh, you know, are you now an art historian or archeologist or artist, uh, artist, architectural historian? Actually, in a certain sense, sometimes I just don't know. I mean, um, and that's actually a, a one approach to the question of how to do we work with disciplines? We have to know that art history, for take art history as an example, it has a history in itself. It's a discipline that has been created in a moment of when nation building in Europe, for example, became important. Universities are created, disciplines are created, curricula had been displayed, uh, uh, set up, and, um, and, 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 we, uh, and, and the discipline comes with a certain range of terms that are op made operational. Let's say, for example, the idea of origin In art history, we always want to know what has been the earliest, let's say, the earliest Renaissance building. But in the end, nobody in the Renaissance thought about being a Renaissance architect. They just continued, and the, para the periods applied backwards from a discipline called art history created these boundaries of 
proto-Renaissance, Renaissance, late Renaissance, Manierism, et cetera, et cetera, backwards on, a, on, on, on objects. And I think the same is true for Angkor Wat in a certain moment. In this case, it's a colonial moment, French colonial moment where excellent researchers brought their Western knowledge onto the site and created Angkor Wat as a masterpiece in a storyline of art and architecture. And it creates also uh, big tension expectations because for example, today, the, the largest amount of atten attention, money, maybe also tax money, but also money from outside is poured onto this spot. Whereas maybe hundreds of other sites on, in all over Cambodia are st still in decay. Let's take let's take Bante Chmar, which is one a very important temple uh, uh, related more to the to the Buddhist, uh, of course, to the to the uh, later Buddhist period, which is not in the very center of the Angkor Park, so it's less visited, less attention, less archaeological investigation, maybe more pillage, more 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 um, uh, people going there and taking out artifacts to big on the art market, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also the whole commodification um, dynamics um, is related to how we apply this grandeur to this object. So we create Angkor Park as the super masterpiece on, on world architectural history. And of course, Siem Reap, which is the, uh, the village, or now it's a big city actually, next to Angkor becomes the major hotspot of cultural heritage tourism in Asia. But it is not necessarily so, it has been produced through in a sense, marketing strategies through different regimes. Also, Sihanouk, so this is not colonial, it's post-colonial time, was very eager to, to, to create a whole heritage parkour with a whole institute and um, a ministry of tourism to make money out of this narrative in post-colonial period. And I think all this hangs things together. So if we if we talk about Angkor Wat as a transcultural objects and heritage, then you can bring people from conservation studies, from museum studies, epigraphy, Buddhists, um, um, religious studies, which I'm not, I have to confess, that's not my studies, uh, 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 bring together and use the site to kind of renegotiate our common understanding on, on disciplines. So I, I cannot say that this is pure art history, it's not pure archaeological history. Um, it's certainly Western Western, as I'm Austrian architectural historian, then I have to say it, and I say it explicitly in the introduction, that I, I will always stay this uh, little uh, Viennese or uh, Austrian European art historian, and that's my, my box. And I, but I may have to make it explicit and say in the introduction where my limitations are. Uh, Joanna, any thoughts on that for the one that also teaching about Southeast Asian history in, in Western? Yeah. I mean, I suppose I would just agree. I would just agree with this sense of, you know, recognizing the what do we mean by the term art history? Um, you know, recognizing the the history of the discipline itself and, and where that comes from, and, and the applicability of um, of art history of our concepts. I mean, I look at late twelfth century um, primarily, so I'm looking at the Bion, and you see so much written about the naturalism and the portraits of the Bion, and you can see the way that. You know, Europeans are, are looking at, at these moments and saying, aha, like this, here's portraiture because it's, it's naturalism. And that's what we understand portraiture to be coming from coming from um, our, our, our training. So I think there is a sense, I think, um, and certainly I often find that I, I you know, where do I sit in terms of, uh, of being an art historian on Southeast Asia? Um, uh, coming from a, a background in, in myself, you know, as an undergraduate looking at philosophy and art history and not as a Southeast Asianist, um, particularly um, where am I coming in? So I think that, yeah, I think it, it, it brings into question and I think kind of the transdisciplinary um, nature of, of, of research and, and how important uh, how important it is to work across disciplines together um, uh, when we're looking at Angkor. Mm. Uh, can I add something on this? It was yeah. interesting that now as, as uh, for example, some, of course, reviews are going through my book and it's an interesting, very interesting moment for me, of course, for every researcher, that 
it highly depends. It's not only the book that has been reviewed, but it's interesting to read the voice of the reviewer because it makes a giant difference to be reviewed by a Japanese ethnographer or a, or a French archeologist. And the reviews are very different. Um, um, uh, for example, uh, one French uh, critique said, well, you know, you're not actually talking about Angkor Wat. It's 19th century history, what you're talking about. And it's not the 12th century site. And I said, oh, I, I would say that in a sense, yes. But on the other hand, the reality that I'm talking about is as strong as the physical original fabric, because what our, our, our heritage regime is producing out of it today is a second reality that is highly effective because it's also destructive. So we have to see that Angkor Wat is still 21st century site. No, it's not yet, it's not dead archeology, span but it's continuing as a living heritage or living entity with all the fabrics and conflicts going over the top of it. So this critique was very interesting for me, even it was maybe a bit critical, but it's, that's the nature of it. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, thank you for the response from both of you. Uh, I want to bring this question of authenticity uh, essence and uh, from the art history and then just to expand it a little bit further from by taking the question from Heidi. Uh, he uh, she question uh, to what extent can we assume cast or plaster cast are a representation of the essence of Angkor? Were they edited to emphasize the story of salvage? Uh, were the cast relief? added to or finished by hands or allowed to reflect the effect of decay and tear? To what extent were those effects allowed to remain in the replicas? Is there a discernible difference pre and post 1907 in relation to the increased mapping of that you mentioned before relating to the production of the cast? Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent uh, questions. Uh, I don't, uh, I hope that um, I, I gave a one one um, little paper that I produced as a as a reading. So so maybe maybe this could be a reading. I don't know whether it was accessible for everyone, or if you want to share it again or so on. Where I I discuss this, especially the moment of plaster cast. So your question is very interesting because even even if uh, you remembered my my this slide when I discussed the the methodological methodological approach that I have that all that the disciplines we apply, all the terminologies we use, the taxonomies we, 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 we create are in, the, in themselves highly dynamic. So it does not mean that what is original and not cannot change over time. And the plaster casts are a very good example of this because I would say that it, the, the, the plaster casts from Angkor themselves went through an enormous um, taxonomical or change um, or, 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 um, along their, their way. In the ninth, late 19th century, as we've been showing you, I would say that the plaster casts made, and jo Joanna, you were right with the same, the parallel moment of taking photographs. So kind of getting to the original surface. So photograph is also taking a surface as an image, transportable and plaster casts are in a way doing the same as on a three-dimensional point of view. And I, will, I think that when I went through the, 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 the uh, um, mission reports by these plaster casts uh, people, um, they thought to go to the original artifact, making a copy of it. So it's actually in the best sense, a secondary source of the original. Because of course, everyone going to the museum in Paris would not say, oh, this is original Cambodia. You would say, oh, that's a plaster cast, and that's not a problem. It represents an original artifact in the storyline of architecture and of art history. So this is what they thought as a secondary source of art in the 19th century. You remember the photograph uh, showing you uh, in the Musée Guimet exhibition in 2013, when the same casts of the late 19th century had been on display again, but now they're not only secondary source of art, but they became a primary source of colonial collecting. So plaster casts today became originals, not for representing art, but being art themselves, because it has been a very important 
technological achievement to produce art um, 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 and plaster casts. And in the late 19th century, just said, well, you know, it's just a technique we applied. Today, we, we do whole conferences on the rebirth of the value of plaster cast. Take the, this, I wanted to say South Kensington Museum, but the, 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 the Victoria and Albert Museum, the whole plaster cast court had been reinvented and restaged some years ago because now plaster casts themselves are appreciated as originals in the history of collecting, art history, archaeology, conservation, whatever you want to call it. So the casts show us that uh, our um, disciplines are in themselves highly dynamic and the values that we apply on artifacts are also uh, highly dynamic. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to move a bit to the contemporary uh, presence. Uh, so the question of heritage, I guess, because there's a lot of question about heritage on the Q&A box. Uh, so there will be uh, three questions that I want to put them up together so that you can answer them uh, directly together. Um, first of all, is from Swati. Uh, is preserving cultural heritage confined to Western modernity? What would be the Khmer notion of heritage? And then uh, the next question is from uh, Soka Seang. Is this interesting to see how Angkor Wat has been internationalized? But it should be noted that even within Cambodia, the temples, not just Angkor Wat, generally have been nationalized, turned it into a national heritage. I am curious about the conflict such nationalization and internationalization may cause conflict to the local inhabitants. And considering how the site such as, such as Angkor is managed today, can it be considered a living heritage site today? And then the last question is from Max Meyer. Um, thank you for the most interesting lectures. I have one question about current ownerships. Which parties or communities do you consider the primary owners in a mental or spiritual, spiritual sense and not in material or legal terms of Angkor Wat as cultural heritage? Michael. Thank you very much for these questions. Um, the question, the first question was, uh, what uh, what would be the Khmer notion over Angkor Wat as an heritage? And I think, first of all, I cannot judge this because this would be, I mean, rather pretentious. Uh, uh, but what I want to say is that what I saw through my eyes, so it's only an interpretation because I cannot uh, speak for Cambodians uh, how they conceive it. But what I found really challenging is that touching in a way that, um, and it is my observation, so don't take it for it is what, what it is. It's just my interpretation is that, for example, when I was uh, um, doing my investigations on the spot, um, for example, in some days I would see Cambodian visitors taking their picnic in front of Angkor Wat on a, on a weekend. So it's a site that belongs as we go to a park in, uh, in London and enjoying uh, the beautiful scenery and of course the beautiful building. On the other hand, you could also uh, be a Buddhist and venerate uh, in a site, you know, venerate Angkor Wat as a, as a Buddhist uh, site and be part of a um, ceremony even marriage, uh, etc. there, or, and that's the third part, you could kind of be part of the heritage regime by visiting it as it should be on a global mode. So let's say taking a tour uh, with a guide explaining this is this scenario and this is this uh, sculpture and this is uh, 20th century and this is uh, 15th century and so on. So I guess the Khmer notion could be a hybrid of of, of different levels and you can switch and change. See, it's the, maybe the same as uh, I'm a Roman Catholic in Vienna. So I can visit uh, the, the, the church next door as a, believe, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Christian, but I can also visit it as an art historian. I can also visit it as a, as a critical person saying that Catholicism is now out and that we should kind of destroy all churches. 
And we can also, so I think the Khmer notion might be a hybrid situation. You could be all of them together, heritage consumer, religious practitioner, joyful, family, relax, picnic person, you know, and um, all together, maybe. The other question was a conflict with inhabitants. Um, what I saw in my uh, in my studies, and it might change over time, but when I when the Angkor Park was established and then kind of in the 1990s into 2000 stabilized and uh, perfectly managed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, of course, the local regime, uh, also Cambodians within APSARA, so the protection agency, were uh, more and more concerned about the local inhabitants within the park. And uh, today, uh, they don't exactly know, but maybe 100,000 people living in Angkor Park. But by the very name of an archaeological park, there are not supposed to be any people because it's archaeological. So by the very naming from the French colonial period, the site is dead and empty. And if you look at the first maps on Angkor Park, there's no village inscribed. It's very hard to find precise markers where they say it's a village, it's a monastery, because that's not the logic of representation on an archaeological map. And this continues because in a certain moment in time, um, the Khmer authorities um, developed um, a strategy of saying, OK, we cannot chase the local inhabitants away from the park because that's where they live, maybe for, for decades. Uh, maybe for centuries. Um, but what we want to do is to um, help them by being careful with the site. And this is the positive interpretation. The negative presentation is you're not allowed to be to build concrete uh, foundations in the park because that will destroy archaeological heritage. And um, um, in a certain moment in time, also houses were demolished by the heritage police saying that they are destructive against archaeological heritage. And other people said, well, this is where we live. I mean, I want to have a house next to my house because I have a daughter and the daughter has a family and the family has children and we are expanding. So they said in a certain moment in time, if you want to live in Angkor Park, that's fine for now. If you want to have a new house, you have to build it outside. And this is, this is how, how uh, conflicts with heritage and inhabitants occur. Mm. And what they created in the East, it was an experiment called uh, Runta Egg. It was an eco village. I treat this in my book as well at the, in the thing, where they said, OK, now let, let, let's give uh, the uh, local inhabitants an idea of how traditional living in the park should be, stilted wooden houses. Let's recreate them outside of the park and giving them the, fabric, the material to create their houses there. Of course, it didn't work because people do not want to leave their family fabric, you know, their relationship, the, the near, the proximity, you know, the, the walking to the next, um, to the neighbors, to the, to the other family members, to the next monastery, and also to the temples. So it was a big failure. It was an experiment being brought from outside as an idea of uh, original, authentic uh, living heritage, applied on the people in the park, and now, and then it was a laboratory little test, and um, it was uh, not working out, but I don't know what it's now. But uh, you see the conflict in it. And the last question, I guess, was the primary owners. Well, I mean, if you following the World Heritage Convention, you would say that the very idea of World Heritage, uh, that uh, these masterpieces of cultural history belong to humanity. So they belong to everyone. That's a fine story, but um, on the other hand, um, um, it has been a conflict uh, over the site um, with the religious community, with the, with the monasteries and with the uh, Buddhist um, communities um, that are until today not a constant stakeholder within the debates of the International, Commu uh, International Coordination Committee. They are not, as far as I know, maybe they changed when I was doing research. Yes, of course, they are Buddhists. So fine, we need this also as a picturesque framing for our heritage industry, of course. I mean, take it critically. 
but they are not being, as far as I know, organized as one voice of, let's say, Buddhist monasteries within the park to give them a, a, a independent, important voice. Maybe it changed, and I hope so, but it, I know there had been big conflicts with religious communities. Maybe this, the same logic as with the inhabitants is also with the monasteries. And, uh, but again, I think it's also a learning process. I mean, from one generation to the other. The emergency listing of Angkor Park was 1992. Uh, this heritage in danger label was lifted and now it's, it's a, let's say a normal world heritage site. And I think it's, it's a constant learning process and hopefully uh, both the inhabitants and the uh, religious monasteries within park have now an independent voice to be heard. But I cannot, uh, I don't know. Mm. If uh, I can just, yeah, if I could just very, I know we're running out of time, but just very quickly jump in, I think, to all of those questions. I think it comes back to that sense of, you know, we talk um, about the colonial period and the post-colonial period as if suddenly, you know, the French, um, Cambodian getting independence suddenly changes the, the landscape completely. Um, and I think you showed at the end of your presentation the kind of the, the echoing of the moments in the 90s to the, the, the kind of colonial moments as well. And I think that then comes into when we talk about, you know, I, I don't want to talk about Khmer notions of heritage here. I know that there's probably people in the audience that can speak to that much better than me. But when we're thinking about ideas of heritage or ideas of nationalization or how we manage the site or, you know, um, I think it all comes back to that, that entangling of colonialist ideas, um, colonialist uh, coloniality in terms of a mentality um, sort of within the, within the Cambodian context and the way that those kind of become uh, sort of entangled and, and, and um, and so, you know, it's not easy to separate that out. And so there, there does, you know, we, it, it is a project, I think, of thinking about decolonizing. And I saw Rex May's question there about, you know, is transculturalism a, a Eurocentric framework? And, and, and you know, and, and I think that comes back to, to thinking about, you know, the project of decolonizing more broadly. And I think, as you said, Michael, you know, one of the first steps is self reflexivity as, as researchers of where are we coming from and what are our limitations but but I think that that touches on when we talk about heritage as a term um, you know what is Cambodian heritage how has that been um, sort of changed um, through through the colonial and the ongoing neo-colonial um, encounters um, but I would certainly say in terms of those living within the Angkorian um, Angkor Park, um, you know, you, you talk about their housing and restrictions there, but there's also restrictions on how they work within the site. So, you know, potential restrictions on where they can, you know, whether where the kids can jump in and bathe in a pond. Um, does it ruin the view for tourists? Um, you know, I spent time in one village where they had their traditional nectar, so their animist um, uh, village sort of uh, deity. Uh, animist deity um, and it had been at one of the temples and that would be where they would go but then they had to move and they had to move that um, site because they weren't allowed to go and um, make offerings and, and do do what they wanted to do at the temple site so there was a way in which that kind of you know museumification of Angkor um, does kind of try and fix it in, in quite a quite a static way which has you know real consequences then for those that live there and yeah yeah question how much of a voice they actually have um, as stakeholders. And I think uh, one, one element is also important. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it would be, as I said uh, uh, several times, too easy to have this colonial, post-colonial, neo-colonial, okay, this is one thing. And I think it's uh, at play during UNESCO's uh, debate over there. I know that I have been also criticized for this, but this is my standpoint. But on the other hand, um, there is also, a, you could also call, um, 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 call it colonial, but it's a kind of a self-colonizing element in this because the uh, ruling elites and also actually the never-ending um, um, uh, premier minister over Cambodia is actually super happy that UNESCO is doing all these uh, things because they pour money and money and experts and training and houses and investments from China and North Korea, maybe also North Korea, South Korea, Thailand over the park and he said oh, it's super fine I mean we get the money 
let's and, and they they do their all the infrastructure but the problem is that for example um, i'm not an, a specialist in performing arts but i know that people doing this and you're doing this in source as well i i know is that it has dramatic consequences for everything of living arts performative arts that which are not directly related to the Angkor storyline. So example, um, dance. Yeah, I treat it in, in, in also in my book, it's like saying the Apsara dance has to be like it was and it has been recreated uh, partly of artificially for world fairs. Um, and it is not meant to be um, developed in let's say hybridized contemporary interpretations, which is actually normal for all dance forms we have in Europe and everywhere. You know, we can have Tchaikovsky in a classical uh, ballet scenario. We can say now the metaur en scène today thinks that we have to kind of bring in a new element. But if you are living in a country, which is one of the smallest um, um, uh, nations in Asia with, with maybe the largest archeological site on the planet, you're, as a ruling elite, rather happy to follow this grandeur line of arche archaeological heritage, whereas you're not as much interested in helping small dance companies in Phnom Penh to develop their contemporary art scene, because that's not bringing money. So they're all dying out. I think the, the, the established uh, performative arts center by Manuel Ivan burned down and was never replaced. So it's not only the bad people from outside, it's also the bad people from inside because uh, um, the prime minister is, is a former Khmer Rouge and he is not interested in any contemporary art practice because that's not his storyline. Yeah. I mean, I hope uh, he's not listening, but I mean, uh, <laughs> okay. you know what I mean? So yeah. it continues and, and local, local, the local art scene is also suffering from this because all the money, all the attention, all the, the moments of, you know, all the tourists they are directed into this package. Mm -hmm. But who goes to Phnom Penh to a contemporary dance uh, evening? Nobody. And that's very sad. Yeah. Okay, then. On that note, I should actually end this uh, discussion today and the seminar today because we're already running out of time. But uh, thank you both. For, thank you, uh, ultimately, Michael, for presenting the the research for us, uh, it's been very fascinating to see all these archival images uh, that you brought up to us today and then discussed it uh, with Joanna and also with the participant today. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, we cannot cover all of the questions that come up in the Q&A box, but hopefully uh, you are also enjoying uh, this seminar today. Uh, Please watch out for our uh, next webinars. Uh, you can stay tuned with our Facebook page or our web page uh, at the center at SOAS uh, for the informations. And for those uh, asking about the slides, uh, we will try to make this uh, recording available online uh, in a couple of weeks, hopefully. Thank you for so much uh, again for Michael and Joanna. Thank and, you very much too. And also for the My pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.